can you make uh, a rational case for this in the preparation of a shot putter? No, you can't. Uh, but the fact is this, athletes like to do dumb shit. And when you're in camp, a lot of the time you have to create opportunities to, to entertain them and help them physically and mentally relax. And the devil tends to make work for idle hands. What's up guys, this is Keir from Strength Coach Network. Happy New Year, gang gang. This is part three in a three-part series reacting to the training of three-time shot put world champion Werner Gunter. If you have not seen part one or part two, click on the card, go watch those videos because as I said in the last video, we're gonna be talking about and continuing on themes that are discussed in each of the prior videos. So if you have not seen those videos, it's gonna to be tough for you to understand what I'm talking about and what's going on. Do me a favor, beat that like button like a red-headed stepchild, click subscribe and click the notification bell so that you'll get an alert every time we release a new video on Strength Coach Network. First thing to look at is this uh, primarily rotational work that's being done with the plate and the ab work. And if we look at the ranges of motion, the muscles being used, we could consider this to be somewhere between uh, general physical preparation and specialized preparatory preparation as outlined in the Bondachuk classification of exercises. Is it really going to be pushing adaptation at this stage of the prep, which is the specific or the explosive phase as we talked about in video one and two? No, it's not. Um, typically what you tend to see is the stuff that constitutes uh, developmental training earlier in the year or earlier in the career just ends up becoming like warm-up stuff later down the line so for an athlete of this level this is really just going to be like a warm-up for the main body of the session and to address stuff like asymmetries and just making sure that he's balanced and, and ready for the intensive work that's coming down the line next you can see that for the first time in this video series he is performing the full shot put under competition conditions, competition weight. And as we said, doing the sport or a piece of the sport is the most specific thing you can do. It's considered the competition exercise in the Bondachuk classification. And another thing to pay attention to is the fact that every single one of these reps is being filmed in slow-mo for evaluation down the line. And of course, we've got this trade-off between overload and specificity. One of the things that I really liked about Franz Bosch's book on coordination is that we have to understand that there's this trade-off between the two. The more overload an exercise uh, offers in a particular aspect, the less specificity is going to offer us. So for example, a 1RM back squat offers a ton of overload, but it offers almost zero specificity for running fast. Given all of the overload and adaptation that has come in phase one and phase two, it makes sense that they're using such a highly specific exercise with such a technical emphasis in the slow-mo video in this phase. So the goal now is not to overload and adapt, but to take the adaptation from previous phases and maximally express it under competition conditions. When we get to the weightlifting, the main thing to pay attention to is just how little is being done in terms of the weightlifting. If you think back to the first two phases, we saw all this unilateral stuff, isolation exercises, lots of pre-fatigue, post-fatigue, and all of these different regimes of muscular work being mixed together. All we're seeing in this phase, which might not necessarily be the entirety of the program, but all you see in this phase is the squat, the bench, the jerk, clean variations and snatch variations performed for traditional kind of like up and down, no particular emphasis on one contraction type or another. And presumably with retention rather than developmental loading. And this is pretty much straight bondage. We know that as the athlete's training age increases, as the preparation gets closer towards competition, we're gonna be doing less, but more specific and more intense. Now faced with this fact, a lot of coaches can succumb to the mental trap of saying, well, okay, if we're in the explosive specific phase, 
why don't we just cut out anything that is not the competition exercise and put all of our eggs into the basket of the most specific thing we can do. And this is a trap because if the adaptations that we get from general and general specific exercises are worth pursuing in the first place, they're worth holding on to. So rather than just neglect them altogether, what you see in this video is that they've dropped it right down to a retention load. So the intensity, volume and frequency of this general to general specific strength work has dropped to that which holds onto it rather than which develops it. You're still gonna want to keep a thread of everything in there throughout the year, but the emphasis changes. 60 to 70% of 1RM is still comfortably enough to hold on to maximal strength adaptations as long as we're putting intent into the bar in the form of a compensatory acceleration technique. Ironically, they highlight this example in the video of how a jerk is gonna be specific for the shot put and it's gonna to transfer to the creation of impulse into the implement in the competition exercise. However, even though this is in the specific explosive phase, the pendulum exercise that we talked about in the previous video, I would actually consider to be more intense and more specific for the shot put just because of the force vectors, the sequencing, and the similarity between those two movements. However, a thing that you have to consider is that they're clearly in a training camp situation, they're abroad, I'm guessing, they're definitely outdoors, and they're not gonna be training with a lot of specialized equipment. So you have to go to war with the army that you have, and it's still a lot more specific than other exercises they could have chosen. So it's okay. For the between the legs throw, with the implement into the sand pit, you can make a case to include this in the program for a couple of reasons. One is if you look at the criteria of dynamic correspondence between this and the competition exercise, it's gonna be a highly specific exercise and it belongs in this phase. However, in the Bondarchuk system, unless I'm mistaken, this was also considered to be an indicator exercise. So they would track uh, your distance in this exercise throughout your career to infer ahead of time what kind of competition distance you are capable of. So for example, if you throw X on the between the legs throw, you can have a reasonable degree of confidence that you're gonna achieve Y in the competition shot put. So it could be that they're using this exercise and measuring throw distance as an indicator, or it could be that they're measuring performance to set up a drop off threshold kind of like a auto-regulatory loading and using it as a specialized developmental exercise. Exactly the same for the repeat bounds. Again, he talks about multiple or repeat bounds being used as an indicator exercise in transfer of training in sport. However, this is obviously gonna be more specific for sprinters, hurdlers, jumpers than it is for a shot putter. Nonetheless, it might just be a useful exercise to record jump distances to try and infer the degree of transfer from the general extensive and the general intensive phases of training to performance in the multiple repeat bounds in this phase. Contrast training, again, being used in this specific phase, but a couple of things to note the difference between the first two videos and this video is that now the resistance exercise is ballistic and repeat or continuous reps in nature and that the reps and the jumps have gone down. So this is again, a clear progression in terms of intensity and a reduction in volume as you would expect. You see him mucking around doing the hurdles, swimming, playing tennis. Can you make uh, a rational case for this in the preparation of a shot putter? No, you can't. Uh, but the fact is this, athletes like to do dumb shit and when you're in camp, a lot of the time you have to create opportunities to, to entertain them and help them physically and mentally relax. And the devil tends to make work for idle hands. So I would much rather that an athlete is having fun doing some kind of physical activity than them being left to their, their own devices and uh, using that unique ability that athletes have to get into trouble. But definitely you see towards the end of this specific phase, with the mental relaxation and also the use of recovery modalities like massage, that there's now an emphasis on the minimization of fatigue. 
that readiness or performance equation, of course, is fitness, i.e. adaptation, minus fatigue. So there's clearly a reduction in training stress at this point in the explosive phase uh, in order to try and minimize fatigue because we're going to lose fatigue faster than we lose fitness. So some small reduction in adaptation or physical outputs is acceptable as long as we lose more fatigue faster than we lose the fitness. And there is going to be this key window where we're hopefully uh, tapered, freshness is maximized, and we're going to see that in the circle. And then the final part of the video, as they transition into the competition period, you can see that there's still this emphasis on film and refinement of technique. Just because physically you're probably at your best and tapered and feeling fresh does not mean that you're going to throw your best at all. You see this in the stopwatch sports, you see this in the team sports, but the adaptation that has been achieved from previous phases of training, there's a skill to utilizing it, expressing it, and getting every last drop out of it. So I would infer from this part of the video that you can see that refinement going on as he progresses through the competition period. And of course you can see this was the year that he set that national record at 22.75. So this brings to a close our reaction series on the finest mullet to ever grace track and field. As ever, please help us to locate the algorithm gods, like, subscribe, share, comment. If there's any other videos that you would like to see in this series, just let us know in the comments below or DM us and we'll get it lined up. Thank you. Congratulations on making it to the end of the video. Why don't you celebrate by watching more just like it? You can also help us on our quest to placate the algorithm gods by liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting. Thanks.